time I'd like to offer up some prayers of the people. Um, Bob's having surgery tomorrow, so we're saying a prayer right now for you that all goes well. This is uh, the uh, appendectomy that he had after, gosh, it's been months now that he had the episode, and now they, now that he's healed, they're able to take it out before he has any other trouble. Uh, so praise be to God for that. We pray that goes well. Um, there are others in our midst who have prayer concerns. I wish you would just write those on the insert in your bulletin and either give them to me directly or place them in the offering plate or give them to one of the ushers and they will get them to me. But we really uh, enjoy praying for each other. It is a great gift that God has given us to be able to lift each other up in prayer. So this morning we just want to turn to, to the Lord and lift up all these names that are in our bulletin this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we are so thankful and grateful for all you do in and through this church. We are thankful for our bell choir. We are thank you, thank, thankful for our chancel choir who will bring us a beautiful program tonight. We are thankful for our musicians that organ offertory just lord what a gift we have in this place to be able to worship you in this way and lord we want to lift up each name that is on this list each concern bob as he prepares for surgery those who will struggle through this holiday for various reasons for loss for difficulties at work at home in families, whatever it may be. You are a God who is with us through it all. We pray, Lord, for our friends at home. May we never forget them. May we reach out to them over this holiday season especially. We pray, Lord, for each of these names listed as ongoing concerns in various states of recovery families traveling to be with families, those who are waiting to hear a diagnosis or to hear the treatment plan for a difficult diagnosis. Be with them each step of the way. May they feel your presence and may they feel your presence through our love and care. We pray your healing touch. and We know, Lord, that in your mercy you hear our prayer. And all of God's people said, Amen. One of my favorite things about Christmas is that families make a point of spending more time together than usual. Amen? I mean, we usually make a way during the holidays to spend time together. Um, it's fun when we get together to swap stories. Do y'all have fun stories that you like to tell? Uh, we had... Every Christmas when we would gather when my uh, father's grandparents were alive, we would joke about how long it took for my grandfather to open the presents. He was one of those who got out his knife and he slit every piece of tape. Do you have one of those in your family? Uh, you know, it's just, yeah, oh, Neil, it's you. <laughs> And they wanted, and I'm like, what do you do with that wrapping paper? You're just going to wad it up and throw it away. But anyway, we've got fun stories that we love to tell. Um, this week, actually, I was, you know, at my therapy session that I have every week, and my therapist was asking me about my family traditions and whether those would be hard, and of course they will be. But it was fun to remember. Um, as my children were growing up, we would let them each open one present on Christmas Eve. Who else does that? Does anybody else let somebody open? And was it usually pajamas? Pajamas, right? So that they would look pretty in the pictures in the morning. <laughs> Just a hint, parents, if you're looking for something, pajamas are a good thing to give on, on Christmas Eve. We got to a point where we let them pick the present, and we would say, not that one, because that would be like the big one, that, that wouldn't have anything if they didn't wait to open that. And then we would uh, go to our live nativity at church some years on Christmas Eve, and then some years it was a Christmas candlelight service. We have one of those here. I hope you'll join us, and it's going to be uh, lovely. We'll have, sing all of the carols you love at Christmas. We'll have many of the Bible lessons that you love to hear. Uh, so I hope you will join us for Christmas Eve candlelight service. 
And then on Christmas morning, we would see what Santa brought. Then we'd hop in our sleigh, and we'd go to my mom and dad's house, and we'd go to my husband's mom and dad's house. They didn't live that far from each other, so we got to do both of them. And I remember the kids got to an age, do we have to leave the house? Um, but then later, they began to understand the value of family, and we recognized what precious times those were. Those were. Sometimes it could be hard, but... Uh, getting in the car, but it was always worth it in the end. And then, I don't know about you, but some of us have kind of crazy traditions. Do you you have some of those that people might say, why do you do that? Um, And I have one of them. When the kids got older, I probably shouldn't admit this because it, it, uh, anyway, when the kids got older, I'm committed now, uh, on Christmas night, they would be with other, you know, their uh, partner's families and, and you know, enjoying Christmas with them, maybe. And Kim and I found ourselves alone. And do you know what movie we watched every year? Yes! Yes! Thank you for not making me feel totally crazy. I don't know. I guess, I guess it's on every year at Christmas because it's a Christmas movie. It is not family-friendly. I do not recommend it for families with children. <laughs> um, the foul language is horrible. But, I mean, I'll probably watch it this year just because it's kind of a sweet thing that that we always did, and um, we got crazy things like that. Family traditions can be so much fun. Of course, some families have painful memories, memories of loss, divisions within the family still, and at a time when family is supposed to gather, it's uh, especially hard. But here is the good news of the gospel. No matter what has happened, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? Not a thing in this world can separate us. That's our heritage of grace. It's a heritage of grace. If you read all of Matthew 1, the lineage of Jesus is is filled with real people, people who really lived in time and um, In many cases, these are flawed individuals. And yet, look what God did, even through those of us who make mistakes. He took these flawed people and through a lineage of grace gave us Jesus, the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. What an incredible gift. This morning, we're going to only read two verses of that lineage Matthew 1, we'll be reading verses 16 and 17, but first let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable to you, my rock and my redeemer. I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear and even more, Lord, a heart to respond to your word spoken into our lives today. Amen. Hear now the word of God from Matthew 1, and I'll be reading verses 16 and 17. Jacob, father of Joseph and the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our children and youth reenacted the nativity last Sunday night. If you missed it, you missed a a real treat. We saw the angels come alive and the wise men and Mary and Joseph. and, And our angels even had a request. We sang Silent Night. It was a beautiful, beautiful night. And we love that image of a sweet, serene scene, it gives us hope because we remember the gift of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But it's also important for us to understand that that first Christmas was anything but neat and tidy. There was a couple, Mary and Joseph, engaged but not yet married, Traveling when she was nine months pregnant. Ladies, can I, who's had children, that's difficult, right? Very difficult. They weren't able to call ahead for reservations. There was no room for them at a five-star hotel, much less an inn. 
you get the idea. It was less than perfect, less than ideal. And looking at the genealogy of Jesus, we get a hint about what God can do no matter our history. As you read through the first chapter of Matthew, there are actually five women in the lineage of Jesus listed in Scripture. Four were Gentiles. Women had no standing in biblical times, yet they're named as key figures in the lineage of the Messiah. These women are important to our heritage of grace. As we look closely at some of the other names and their histories, we learn quite a bit. And to be honest, with children in the sanctuary, I can't actually tell those stories. They're not necessarily neat and clean. Trust me when I say that there are some people with a sketchy past in the genealogy of Jesus, okay? I'm just going to say that. We all understand that. It's not all perfect. Yet God still used them. That's a powerful reminder that through it all, God is with us. God does not forsake us. And that is the hope of this season of Advent. No matter what's wrong with our family, no matter the humiliation we may have faced, no matter what mistakes we have made, God can take what the world declares a disaster and turn it into a message of grace and redemption. This is our heritage of grace. It's amazing, really, when you look at the family tree. Abraham and Sarah, they were too old to have children, and yet they did. Jacob cheated his brother out of the family inheritance, and yet God used him. Skipping down to David, who whose son Solomon is described as the son of the woman who was Uriah's wife. Despite his imperfections, God described David as a man after God's own heart in 1 Samuel 13, 14. So you get the idea, right? Family trees can have broken limbs, and yet God can use our brokenness and make it into something beautiful. I see all this as a reminder of our heritage of grace. That's what I want us to remember this Christmas. When we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, when we believe that Jesus died for our sins, when we believe that Jesus rose from the dead, all so that we can have new life in Christ, we become a part of the family of God. This is our heritage of grace. And this lineage of grace in Matthew 1 reminds us that families can be messy. There can be moments of unfaithfulness, moments of fear, moments of scandal. Looking at the lineage of Jesus, we get a hint about what God can do, no matter our history. God can take what is broken and make it new. So church, are there broken places in each of us that need God's healing touch in our families? Maybe things in our past that we think make us unworthy of God's love. We need to let go of that shame. We need to live in to the promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. I want you to hear that promise in Romans 8, and I'm going to read this part from, this is the New Revised Standard Version, but I wanted to read this from the New Living Translation, which is sometimes easier to understand. Starting with verses 1 through 4, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. This is directly from God's Word. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. 
So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. The law can't save us. Only the love of Christ can save us. Do you hear that? There is, therefore, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. Skipping ahead to verse 11 of Romans 8, it says, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. As our Advent reading, as the petty said, Do what you did then today, Lord. Let us see it today, Lord. And we see it through those of us that the Spirit lives in. So the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you, living within me. Praise be to God. God's Spirit lives in us today. Paul continues this theme of our heritage of grace in verse 15. He says, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father, for his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. What an inheritance, amen? We are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. I had a chance this morning to sit in on that 9 a.m. Bible study and uh, because the bells were ringing and they needed to practice, Derek agreed to lead that Sunday school class this morning. And I got to hear him talking about righteousness. And what does it cost us? He gave an example that we face every day. When somebody is riding our tail in traffic, we have a choice. We can either use some of that language from Die Hard or maybe give them a gesture that's not very friendly or we can pray for them. Lord, why ever they're in a hurry, get them there safely. I don't know what they're going through, but you do. This is how we know our hearts are made right with God is when the simplest of things don't anger us. Don't upset us. Instead, we call on Jesus for his strength, for his grace. It makes all the difference in the world. So we're going to have trouble. We're going to have bumps in the road is what the scripture tells us. But here's that promise that God is going to be with us through it all. I'm picking up now Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? 
Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean that he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I am convinced that nothing can separate, can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, this is our heritage of grace. And what a beautiful heritage it is. This is the hope we have in Christ. This is the hope born to us on Christmas morning. A hope revealed through a lineage with more than one broken limb. Evidence that God can take what is broken and make something beautiful. May it be so in our lives today. Amen. <laughs>